Harry Potter, the Chamber of Secrets, Chapter 16, The Chamber of Secrets. All those times we were in that bathroom and she was just three toilets away, said Ron bitterly at breakfast next day. And we could have asked her. And now it'd been hard enough trying to look for spiders escaping their teachers long enough to sneak into a girl's bathroom. The girl's bathroom, moreover, right next to the scene of the first attack, was going to be almost impossible. But something happened in their first lesson, Transfiguration which drove the Chamber of Secrets out of their minds for the first time in weeks. Ten minutes into the class, Professor McGonagall told them that their exams would start on the 1st of June, one week from today. Exams! How old Seamus Finnegan were still getting exams! There was a loud bang behind Harry as Neville Longbottom's wand slipped, vanishing one of the legs on his desk. Professor McGonagall restored it with a wave of her own wand and turned, frowning, to Seamus. The whole point of keeping the school open at this time is for you to receive your education, she said sternly. The exams will therefore take place as usual and I trust you are all revising hard. Revising hard? It never occurred to Harry that there would be exams with the castle in this state. There was a great deal of mutinous muttering around the room, which made Professor McGonagall scowl even more darkly. Professor, Dum Professor Dumbledore's instructions were to keep the school running as normally as possible, she said, and that I had merely point out means finding out how much you've learned this year. Harry looked down at the pair of white rabbits he was supposed to be turning into slippers. What had he learned this year so far? couldn't seem to think of anything that would be useful in an exam. Ron looked as though he'd been told he had to go and live in the Forbidden Forest. Can you imagine me taking exams with this? He asked Harry, holding up his wand, which had just started whistling loudly. Three days before their first exam, Professor McGonagall made another announcement at breakfast. I have good news, she said, and the Great Hall, instead of falling silent, erupted. Dumbledore's coming back, several people yelled joyfully. You've caught the air of Slytherin, squealed a girl on the Ravenclaw table. Quidditch matches are back on, roared Wood excitedly. When the hubbub had subsided, Professor McGonagall said, Professor Sprout has informed me that the mandrakes are ready for cutting at last. <clears throat> Tonight we will be able to revive those people who have been petrified. I need hardly remind you that one of them may able may well be able to tell us who or what attacked them. I am hopeful that this dreadful year will end with our catching the culprit. There was an explosion of cheering. Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and wasn't at all surprised to see that Draco Malfoy hadn't joined in. Rowan, however, was looking happier than he'd looked in days. It won't matter that we never asked Myrtle then, he said to Harry. Hermione will probably have all the answers when they wake her up. Mind you, she'll go mad when she finds out we've got exams in three days' time. She hasn't revived. It might be kinder to leave her where she is until they're over. Just then, Ginny Weasley came over and sat down next to Ron. She looked tense and nervous, and Harry noticed that her hands were twisting in her lap. What's up, said Ron, helping himself to more porridge. Ginny didn't say anything but glanced up and down the Gryffindor table with a scared look on her face that reminded Harry of someone, though who he couldn't think. Spit it out, said Ron, watching her. Harry suddenly realised who Ginny looked like. She was rocking backwards and forwards slightly in her chair, exactly like Dobby did when he was teetering on the edge of revealing forbidden information. I've got to tell you something, Ginny mumbled, carefully not looking at Harry. Is it, said Harry. Ginny looked as though she couldn't find the right words. What? said Ron. Ginny opened her mouth but no sound came out. Harry leaned forward and spoke quietly so that only Ginny and Ron could hear him. Is it something about the Chamber of Secrets? Have you seen something, something, someone acting oddly? Ginny drew a deep breath and at that precise moment Percy Weasley appeared looking tired and wan. If 
you've finished eating, I'll take that seat, Ginny. I'm starving. I've only just came off patrol duty. Ginny jumped up as though her chair had just been electrified, gave Percy a fleeting, frightened look and scampered away. Percy sat down and grabbed a mug from the centre of the table. Percy, said Rowan angrily, she was just about to tell us something important. Halfway through a cup of tea, Percy choked. The sort of thing, he said, coughing. I just asked her if she'd seen anything odd and she started to say, Oh, that, that's nothing to do with the Chamber of Secrets, said Percy at once. How do you know, said Rowan, his eyebrows raised. Well, uh, if you must know, Ginny uh, walked in on me the other day when I was, uh, well, never mind. The point is she spotted me doing something and I, um, I asked her not to mention it to anybody. I must say I did think she'd keep her word. It's nothing really, I'd just rather. Harry had never seen Percy look so uncomfortable. What are you doing, said Ron, grinning. Go on, tell us, we won't laugh. Percy didn't smile back. Pass me those rolls, Harry. I'm starving. Harry knew the whole mystery might be solved tomorrow without their help, but he wasn't about to pass up a chance to speak to Myrtle if it turned up, and to his delight it did, mid-morning when they were being led to the history of magic by Gilderoy Lockhart. Lockhart, who'd so often assured them that all danger had passed only to be proved wrong, straight away was now wholeheartedly convinced it was hardly worth the trouble to see them safely down the corridors. His hair wasn't as sleek as usual. It seemed he'd been up most of the night patrolling the fourth floor. Mark my words, he said, ushering them round a corner. The first words out of those poor petrified people's mouths will be, it was Hagrid. Frankly, I'm astounded Professor McGonagall thinks all these security measures are necessary. I agree, sir, said Harry, making Ron drop his books in surprise. Thank you, Harry, said Lockhart graciously, while they waited for a long line of Hufflepuffs to pass. I mean, we teachers have quite enough to be getting on with without walking students to classes and standing guard all night. That's right, said Ron, catching on. Why don't you leave us here, sir? We've only got one more corridor to go. You know, Weasley, I think I will, said Lockhart. I really should go and prepare my next class. And he hurried off. Prepare his class, Ron stared after him. Gone to curl his hair, more like. They let the rest of Gryffindor's draw ahead of them, then darted down a side passage and hurried off towards Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. But just as they were congratulating each other on their brilliant scheme, Potter, Weasley, what are you doing? It was Professor McGonagall and her mouth was the thinnest of thin lines. We were, we were, Ron stammered, we were going to, to go and see... Hermione, said Harry, and Ron and Professor McGonagall both looked at him. We haven't seen her for ages, Professor Harry went on hurriedly, treading on Ron's foot, and we thought we'd sneak into the hospital wing, you know, and tell her the mandrakes are nearly ready, and uh, not to worry. Professor McGonagall was still staring at him, and for a moment Harry thought she was going to explode. But when she spoke, it was in a strangely croaky voice. Of course, she said, and Harry, amazed, saw a tear glistening in her beady eye. Of course, I realise this has all been hardest on the friends of those who have been. I quite understand. Yes, Potter, of course you may visit Miss Granger. I will inform Professor Binns where you've gone. Tell Madame Pomfrey I have given my permission. Harry and Rowan walked away, hardly daring to believe they'd avoided detention. As they turned the corner... They distinctly heard Professor McGonagall blow her nose. That, said Ron fervently, was the best story you've ever come up with. They had no choice but to go to the hospital wing and tell Madame Pomfrey that they had McGo Professor McGonagall's permission to visit Hermione. Madame Pomfrey let them in, but reluctantly. There's just no point talking to a petrified person, she said. And they had to admit she was right when they'd taken their seats next to Hermione. It was plain that Hermione didn't have the faintest inkling that she had visitors. And that they might as well tell her bedside cabinet not to worry for all the good it would do. 
wonder if she did see the attacker, though, said Ron, looking sadly at Hermione's rigid face. Because if he sneaked up in the mole, no one will ever know. But Harry wasn't looking at Hermione's face. He was far more interested in her right hand. It lay clenched on top of her blankets, and bending closer, he saw that a piece of paper was scrunched inside her fist. Making sure that Madame Palfrey was nowhere near, he pointed this out to Ron. Try and get it out, Ron whispered, shifting his chair so that he blocked Harry from, Maddie's, from Madame Pomfrey's view. It was no easy task. Hermione's hand was clamped so tightly around the paper that Harry was sure he was going to tear it. While Ron kept watch, he tugged and twisted and at last, after several tense minutes, the paper came free. It was a page torn from a very old library book. Harry smoothed it out eagerly and Ron leaned close to read it too. Of the many fearsome beasts and monsters that roam our land, there is none more curious or more deadly than the Ballisk, known also as the King of Serpents. This snake, which may reach gigantic size and live many hundreds of years, is born from a chicken egg hatched beneath a toad. Its methods of killing are most wondrous, for aside from its deadly and venomous fangs, the Ballisk basilisk, basilisk has a murderous stare, and all who are fixed with the beam of its eye shall suffer instant death. Spiders flee before the basilisk, for it is their mortal enemy, and the basilisk flees only from the crowing of the rooster, which is fatal to it. And beneath this, a single word had been written in a hand Harry recognised as Hermione's. Pipes. It was as though someone had just flicked a light in his brain. Ron, he prayed, this is it. This is the answer. The monsters in the chambers are basilisk and giant serpent. That's why I've been hearing that voice all over the place and nobody else has heard it. It's because I understand parcel tongue. Harry looked up at the beds around him. The basilisk kills people by looking at them, but no one's died because no one looked it straight in the eye. Colin saw it through the camera. The basilisk burned up all the film, film inside it, but Paul, Colin just got petrified. Justin, Justin must have seen the basilisk through nearly headless Nick. Nick got the full blast of it, but he couldn't die again. And Hermione and that Ravenclaw prefect were found with a mirror next to them. Hermione had just realised the monster was a basilisk. I bet you anything she warned the first person she met to look round corners with a mirror first. And that girl pulled out a mirror and... Ron's jaw had just dropped. And Mrs Norris, he whispered eagerly. Harry thought hard, picturing the scene on the night of Halloween. The water... He said slowly, the flood from Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. I bet you Mrs Norris only saw the reflection. He scanned the page in his hand eagerly. The more he looked at it, the more it made sense. The basilisk frees only from the, crowing, from the crowing of the rooster, which it's fatal to. He read aloud, Hagrid's roosters were killed. The heir of Slytherin didn't want one anyone didn't want one anywhere near the castle once the chamber was opened. Spiders flee before the basilisk. It all fits. But how's the basilisk been getting around the place, said Ron? A dirty great snake. Someone would have seen. Harry, however, pointed at the word Hermione had scribbled at the foot of the page. Pipes, he said. Pipes, Ron, it's been using the plumbing. I've been hearing that voice inside the walls. Ron suddenly grabbed Harry's arm. The entrance to the Chamber of Secrets, he said hoarsely. What if it's a bathroom? What if it's in... Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, said Harry. They sat there, excitement coursing through them, hardly able to believe it. This means, said Harry, I can't be the only parcel mouth in the school. The heir of Slytherin's one too. That's how they've been controlling the basilisk. What are we going to do, said Ron, whose eyes were flashing. Shall we go straight to McGonagall? Let's go to the staff room, said Harry, jumping up. 
She'll be there in 10 minutes. It's nearly break. They ran downstairs, not wanting to be discovered hanging around in another corridor. They went straight into the deserted staff room. It was a large panelled room full of dark wooden chairs. Harry and Rowan paced around it, too excited to sit down. But the bell to signal break never came. Instead, echoing through the corridors came Professor McGonagall's voice, magically magnified. All students returned to their house dormitories at once. All teachers returned to the staff room. Immediately, please. Harry wheeled around to stare at Rowan. Not another attack, not now. What will we do, said Rowan aghast, go back to the dormitory? No, said Harry, glancing around. There was an ugly sort of wardrobe to his left, full of teacher's cloaks. In here, let's hear what it's all about. Then we can tell them what we've found out. They hid themselves inside it, listening to the rumbling of hundreds of people moving overhead and the staff room door banging open. From between the musty folds of the cloak, they watched the teachers filtering into the room. Some of them were looking puzzled, others downright scared. Then Professor McGonagall arrived. It has happened, she told the silent staff room. A student has been taken by the monster right into the chamber itself. Professor Flitwick let out a squeal. Professor Sprout clapped her hands over her mouth. Snape gripped the back of a chair very hard and said, How can you be sure? Air of Slytherin, said Professor McGonagall, who was very white, left another message right under the first one. Her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. Professor Flitwick burst into tears. Who is it, said Madame Gooch, who had sunk weak kneed into a chair? Which student? Jimmy Weasley, said Professor McGonagall. Harry felt Rowan slide silently down the wardrobe beside him. We shall have to send all the students home tomorrow, said Professor McGonagall. This is the end of Hogwarts. Dumbledore always said. The staff room door banged open again. For one wild moment, Harry was sure it would be Dumbledore. But it was Lockhart and he was beaming. So sorry, dozed off. What have I missed? He didn't seem to notice that the other teachers were looking at him with something remarkably like hatred. Snape stepped forward. Just the man, he said, the very man. A girl has been snatched by the monster Lockhart, taken into the Chamber of Secrets itself. Your moment has come at last. Lockhart blanched. That's right, Gilderoy, chipped in Professor Sprout. Weren't you saying just last night that you've known all along where the entrance to the Chamber of Secrets is? I, well, I, I, spluttered Lockhart. Yes, didn't you tell me you were sure you knew what was inside, piped up Professor Flitwick. Did, did I? I? I don't recall. I certainly remember you saying you were sorry you hadn't had a crack at the monster before Hagrid was arrested, said Snape. Didn't you say that the whole affair had been bungled and that you should have been given a free reign from the first? Lockhart stared around at his stony-faced colleagues. I, I, I really never, you, you may have misunderstood. We'll leave it to you then, Dil Gilderoy, said Professor McGonagall. Tonight will be an excellent time to do it. We'll make sure everyone's out of your way. You'll be able to tackle the monster all by yourself. A free reign at last. Lockhart gazed desperately around him. But nobody came to the rescue. He didn't look remotely handsome anymore. His lip was trembling and in the absence of his usual toothy grin, he looked weak-chinned and weedy. Ve very well, he said. I'll, I'll, I'll be in my office getting, get, getting ready. And he left the room. Right, said Professor McGonagall, whose nostrils were flared. That's got him out from under our feet. The head of houses should go and inform the students what has happened. Tell them the Hogwarts Express will take them home first thing tomorrow. Will the rest of you please make sure no students have been left outside the dormitories? The teachers rose and left, one by one. It was probably the worst day of Harry's entire life. He, Ron, Fred and George sat together in the corner of Gryffindor Common Room, unable to say anything to each other. Percy wasn't there. 
He'd gone to send an owl to Mr and Mrs Weasley, then shut himself up in his dormitory. No afternoon ever lasted quite as long as that one, nor had Gryffindor Tower ever been so crowded, yet so quiet. Near sunset, Fred and George went up to bed, unable to sit there any longer. She knew something, Harry, said Rowan, speaking for the first time, since they had entered the wardrobe in the staff room. That's why she was taken. <coughs> it wasn't some stupid thing about Percy after all. She found out something about the Chamber of Secrets. That must be why she was... Rowan rubbed his eyes frantically. I mean, she was a pure blood. There can't be any other reason. Harry could see the sun sinking blood red below the skyline. This was the worst he had ever felt. If only there was something they could do. Anything. Harry, said Rowan, do you think there's any chance at all she's not, you know? Harry didn't know what to say. He couldn't see how Ginny could still be alive. Do you know what, said Rowan? I think we should go and see Lockhart. Tell him what we know. He's going to try and get into the chamber. We can tell him who we think it, where we think it is and tell him it's a basilisk in there. Because Harry couldn't think of anything else to do and because he wanted to be doing something, he agreed. The Gryffindors around them were so miserable and felt so sorry for the Weasleys that nobody tried to stop them as they got up, crossed the room and left through the portrait hole. Darkness was falling as they walked down to Lockhart's office. There seemed to be a lot of activity going on inside. They could hear scraping, thumps and hurried footsteps. Harry knocked and there was a sudden silence from inside. Then the door opened the tiniest crack and they saw one of Lockhart's eyes peering through it. Oh, Mr Potter, Mr Weasley, he said, opening the door a mite wider. I'm, I'm rather busy at the moment, if you would be quick. Professor, we've got some information for you, said Harry. We think it will help you. Uh, well, uh, it's not terribly the side of Lockhart's face that they could see looked very uncomfortable. I mean, well, all right. He opened the door and they entered. His office had almost been completely stripped. Two large trunks stood open on the floor. Ropes, jade green, lilac, midnight blue, had been hastily folded into one of them. Books were jumbled untidily into the other. The photographs that covered the walls were now crammed into boxes on the desk. Are you going somewhere, said Harry. E e well, yes, said Lockhart, ripping a life-size poster of himself from the back of the door as he spoke and started to roll it up. Urgent call, unavoidable, got to go. What about my sister, said Rowan. Well, as to that, most unfortunate, said Lockhart, avoiding their eyes as he wrenched open a drawer and started emptying the contents into a bag. No one regrets more than I. You're the defence against the dark arts teacher, said Harry. You can't go now, not with all the dark stuff going on here. Well, I, I must say, when I took this job, Lockhart muttered, now piling socks on top of his robes. Nothing in the job description. Didn't expect... You mean you're running away, said Harry disbelievingly, after all that stuff you did in your books. Books can be misleading, said Lockhart delicately. You wrote them, Harry shouted. My dear boy, said Lockhart, straightening up and frowning at Harry, do use your common sense. My books wouldn't have sold half as well if people didn't think I'd done all those things. No one wants to read about some ugly old Armenian warlock even if he did save a village from werewolves, he'd look dreadful on the front cover. No dress sense at all. And the witch who banished the abandoned banshee had a hairy chin. I mean, come on. So you've been taking credit for what a lot of other people have done, said Harry incredulously. Harry, Harry, said Lockhart, shaking his head impatiently. It's not nearly as simple as that. There was work involved. I had to track these people down. Ask them exactly how they managed to do what they did. Then I had to put a memory charm on them so they wouldn't remember doing it. If there's one thing I pride myself on, it's my memory charms. No, it's been a lot of work, Harry. It's not all book signings and publicity photos, you know. You want fame, you have to be prepared for a long, hard slog. He banged the lids of his trunk shut and locked them. Let's see, he said. I think that's everything. Yes. Only one thing left. He pulled out his wand and turned to him. 
awfully sorry boys but I'll have to put a memory charm on you now can't have you blabbing my secrets all over the place I'd never sell another book Harry reached his wand just in time Lockhart had barely raised his when Harry bellowed Expelleremus Lockhart was blasted backwards falling over his trunk his wand flew high into the air Ron caught it and flung it out the open window should have let Professor Snape sh teach us that one, said Harry furiously, kicking Lockhart's trunk aside. Lockhart was looking up at him. Would he once more? Harry was still pointing his wand at him. What do you want me to do, said Lockhart weakly? I don't know where the Chamber of Secrets is. There's nothing I can do. You're in luck, said Harry, forcing Lockhart to his feet at wand point. We think we know where it is and what's inside. Let's go. They marched Lockhart out of his office and down the stairs, along the dark corridor where the message is shone in the wall to the door of Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. They sent Lockhart in first. Harry was pleased to see that he was shaking. Moaning Myrtle was sitting on the cistern at the end of the toilet. What's you, she said when she saw Harry. What do you want this time? To ask how you died, said Harry. Myrtle's whole aspect changed at once. She looked as though she'd never been asked such a flattering question. Oh, it was dreadful, she said with relish. It happened right in here. I died in this very cubicle. I remember it so well. I'd hidden because all of Hornbeat was teasing me about my glasses. The door was locked and I was crying. And then I heard somebody come in. They said something funny. A different language, I think it must have been. Anyway, what really got me was that it was a boy speaking. So I unlocked the door to tell him to go and use his own toilet. And then Myrtle swelled importantly, her face shining. I died. How? said Harry. No idea, said Myrtle in hushed tones. I just remember seeing a pair of great big yellow eyes. My whole body sort of seized up and then I was floating away. She looked dreamily at Harry, and then I came back again. I was determined to haunt all of Hornby, you see. Oh, she was sorry she ever laughed at my glasses. Where exactly did you see the eye? said Harry. Somewhere there, said Myrtle, pointing vaguely towards the sink in front of her toilet. Harry and Ron hurried over to it. Lockhart was standing well back, a look of utter terror on his face. It looked like an ordinary sink. They examined every inch of it, inside and out, including the pipes below. And then Harry saw it. Scratched on the side of one of the copper taps was a tiny snake. That taps never worked, said Myrtle brightly as he tried to turn it. Harry, say something, something in parcel tongue. But Harry thought hard. The only time he'd ever managed to speak parcel tongue was when he'd been faced with a real snake. He stared hard at the tiny engraving, trying to imagine it was real. Open up, he said. He looked at Ron, who shook his head. English, he said. Harry looked back at the snake, willing himself to believe it was alive. If he moved his head, the candlelight make it look as though it was moving. Open up, he said. Except the words weren't what he heard. A strange hissing had escaped him, and at once the tap glowed with a brilliant white light and began to spin. Next second, the sink began to move. The sink, in fact, sank right out of sight, leaving a large pipe exposed, a pipe wide enough for a man to slide into. Harry heard Ron gasp and looked up. He'd made up his mind what he was going to do. I'm going down there, he said. He couldn't not go, not now that they'd found the entrance to the chamber. Not if there was even the faintest, slimmest, wildest chance that Ginny might be alive. Me too, said Ron. There was a pause. Well, you hardly seem to need me, said Lockhart with a shadow of his old smile. I'll just... He put his hand on the doorknob, but Ron and Harry both pointed their wands at him. You can go first, Ron snarled. White face and wandless Lockhart approached the opening. Boys, he said, his voice feeble. Boys! What good will it do? Harry jabbed him in the back with his wand. Lockhart slid his legs into the pipe. 
I really don't think he started to say, but Rowan gave him a push and he slid out of sight. Harry followed quickly. He lowered himself slowly into the pipe, then let go. It was like rushing down an endless, slimy, dark slide. You could see more pipes branching off in all directions, but none as large as theirs, which twisted and turned, sloping steeply downwards. And he knew that he was falling deeper below the school than even the dungeons. Behind him he could hear Rowan flitting slightly at the curves. And then, just as he began to worry what would happen when he hit the ground, the pipe levelled out and he shot out of the end with a wet thud, landing on the damp floor of the dark stone tunnel. Large enough to stand in. Lockhart was getting to his feet a little way away, covered in slime and white as a ghost. Harry stood aside as Rowan came whizzing out of the pipe too. We must be miles under the school, said Harry, his voice echoing in the black tunnel. Under the lake, probably, said Rowan, squinting around at the dark, slimy walls. All three of them turned to stare into the darkness ahead. Lumos, Harry muttered to his wand and it lit again. Come on, he said to Rowan and Lockhart and off they went, their footsteps slapping loudly on the wet floor. The tunnel was so dark that they could only see a little distance ahead. Their shadows and the wet walls looked monstrous in the wand light. Remember, Harry said quietly, as they walked cautiously forward, any sign of movement, close your eyes straight away. But the tunnel was as quiet as the grave, and the first unexpected sound they heard was a loud crunch as Ron stepped in what turned out to be a rat's skull. Harry lowered his wand to look at the floor and saw that it was littered with small animal bones. Trying very hard not to imagine what Ginny might look like if he found her, Harry led the way forward, found a dark bend in the tunnel. Harry, there's something up there, said Ron hoarsely, grabbing Harry's shoulder. He froze, watching. Harry could see the outline of something huge and curved lying right across the tunnel. It wasn't moving. Maybe it's asleep, he breathed, glancing back at the other two. Lockhart's hands were pressed over his eyes. Harry turned back to look at the thing, his heart beating so fast it hurt. Very slowly, his eyes as narrow as he could make them and still see, Harry edged forward, his wand held high. The light slid over a gigantic snakeskin of vivid poisonous green, lying curled and empty across the tunnel floor. The creature that shed it must have been 20 feet long at last. Blimey, said Rowan weakly. There was a sudden movement behind them. Gilderoy Lockhart's knees had given way. Get up, said Rowan sharply, pointing his wand at Lockhart. Lockhart got to his feet, then he dived at Rowan, knocking him to the ground. Harry jumped forward, but too late. Lockhart was straightening up, panting. Rowan's wand in his hand and a gleaming smile back on his face. The adventure ends here, boys, he said. I shall take a bit of this skin back up to the school, tell them I was too late to save the girl and that you two tragically lost your minds at the sight of her mangled body. Say goodbye to your memories. He raised Ron's sellotaped wand high over his head and yelled, Obliviate! The wand exploded with the force of a small bomb. Harry flung his arms over his head and ran slipping over the coils of snakeskin out of the way of great chunks of tunnel ceiling which were thundering to the floor. Next moment he was standing alone, gazing at a solid wall of broken rock. Rowan, he shouted, are you okay, Rowan? I'm here, came Rowan's muffled voice from behind the rock fall. I'm okay, this gets not though. He got blasted by the wand. There was a dull thud and a loud, ow! It sounded as though Rowan had just kicked Lockhart in the shins. What now, Rowan's voice said, sounding desperate. We can't get through. It'll take ages. Harry looked up at the tunnel ceiling. Huge cracks had appeared in it. He had never tried to break apart anything as large as these rocks by magic. And now it didn't seem like a good moment to try. What if the whole tunnel caved in? There was another thud and another ow! From behind the rocks. They were wasting time. 
Jimmy had already been in the Chamber of Secrets for hours. Harry knew there was only one thing to do. Wait here, he called to Ron. Wait with Lockhart. I'll go on. If I'm not back in an hour, there was a very pregnant pause. I'll try and shift some of this rock, said Ron, who seemed to be trying to keep his voice steady, so you can, can get back through. And Harry? See you in a bit, said Harry, trying to inject some confidence into his shaking voice. And he set off alone past the giant snakeskin. Soon the distant noise of Ron straining to shift the rocks was gone. The tunnel turned and turned again. Every nerve in Harry's body was tingling unpleasantly. He wanted the tunnel to end, yet dreaded what he found when he did. And then, at last, as he crept around yet another bend, he saw a solid wall ahead on which two entwined serpents were carved, their eyes set with great glittering emeralds. Harry approached his throat very dry. There was no need to pretend these snakes this there was no need to pretend these stone snakes were real. Their eyes looked strangely alive. He could guess what he had to do. He cleared his throat and the emerald eyes seemed to flitter seemed to flicker. Open, said Harry in a low, faint hiss. The serpents parted as the wall cracked open. The half slid smoothly out of sight and Harry, shaking from head to foot, walked.